Hi everyone, I'm Brittany Haig. I am the horticultural educator for Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties for, with Illinois Extension. So thanks for joining us. And hi, I'm Sherry Burcham. I am a family life educator with the U of I Extension and I cover the counties of Coles, Cumberland, Shelby, Moultrie, and Douglas, and just about any other county that calls and needs my, my help. Thanks for being here. All right, so again, we wanna thank you for joining us today. Um, this topic is really near and dear to Sherry and I, um, and we hope you find value and interest into learning more about wellness in nature. So we wanna start, like, what does it mean? What does wellness in nature mean? And it really can mean something different for everyone. I can kind of sum it up pretty easily, though, by saying that we can all benefit from time in nature. So purposely spending time in natural spaces or maybe bringing nature into your everyday life can definitely benefit both your mental and your physical well-being. And a little secret, it really doesn't take much. Uh, spending as little as two hours a day in nature, or two hours a week, I guess, um, in nature can really have significant health benefits. So that's just a little bit of time every day, and it, it can add up. Uh, but Sherry and I really believe that it's more than just being in nature. It's really being present, being aware in the moment, observing the world around you, and really appreciating the environment you're in. So today we're going to, um, a little bit what we're gonna do, we're gonna start by, uh, Sherry's gonna do the talk about the benefits and the current research behind the benefits of spending in nature. There are so many research opportunities going on right now that, that show us that it's wonderful to spend time in nature for our well-being. Uh, she's also gonna talk about some mindfulness walk in nature and some tips and some prompts that you can use when you're out in nature doing those mindful walks. Um, then I'm gonna share some tips, some design ideas, some plant ideas for sensory gardens and some sensory activities. And then we're gonna end by sharing some other activities to be present in nature and to appreciate your surroundings. Really the goal of this presentation is to inspire you to wanna to spend more time outside, to improve your health, to improve your well-being, and really to give you some ideas and some resources for that outside time, um, no, no matter if it's in your backyard or if it's at a state park. So it's, our goal is just to, to inspire and to, to help you um, find that those opportunities and to maximize the, the time you spend outside. Okay. Thank you, Brittany. So um, in the 2015-16 Nature of Americans National Report, um, there were more than half of adults reported spending five hours or less in nature each week, and three quarters of them spent 10 or fewer hours outside. Parents of children that were eight to 12 years old said that their children only spent about three times as many hours with computers and televisions than they did playing outside. So we see that technology and media were the major reasons for not being out um, outside and in nature, but the study also said that people were spending less time in nature because the places where they worked, where they lived, where they went to school, generally didn't encourage contact with the natural world. And because there were competing priorities and activities that pushed experiences in nature to the side. So the study also showed that minority groups and young adults face even more barriers to getting out into nature than other groups. So other studies that um, we reviewed showed that as humans, especially children, um, we are spending less time outdoors than in the past, and that this is a contributing to a range of mental and physical issues that could be termed as nature deficit disorder. Um, this is not technically a, a technical medical term, but um, it's it's something that they're they're calling it. And they're seeing rising rates uh, of allergies, autoimmune disorders. And there's been less protection against diseases like depression, diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, cancers. And it can be the result of less time spent in and around nature. So I'm going to talk about um, the benefits. And it, it seems like we've always really known 
that being outdoors and getting a breath of fresh air, so to speak, you know, was good for us. Okay. But now we've kind of got the backing of, of that and, and, and why that is. And many studies over the years have shown a positive correlation between spending time in nature and improved mental and physical health outcomes. So if you look at the screen, you can see just a huge laundry list there of, um, of illnesses that are affected by um, exposure to nature. You know, there, we have a decreased incidence of anxiety and depression um, and of infectious diseases, cancer, cardiovascular disease, migraines, respiratory disease, and of course, definitely stress um, is a big one. So even, you know, life expectancy and longevity has been shown um, to be affected by the being out in nature and um, basically soaking in all the good benefits of that. I want to take a, a deeper dive here real quick at the mental benefits of being in and around nature and, and green spaces. There's been several studies that measure heart rate, blood pressure, and perceived stress that provide evidence that your cortisol levels, which cortisol is basically the sh stress hormone, those decrease when participants were exposed to natural um, environments. Exposure has also been associated with alterations in brain activity in an area of the brain that it plays an important part in emotional regulation. So people are feeling more feelings of comfort and relaxation, and also a reduction in feelings of hostility and depression and anxiety among people with acute and chronic stress when they are out in nature. We're also seeing cognitive function being affected um, with study participants, but while they're exhibiting improved attention, executive function, and perceived restorativeness. And in regard to youth, Studies show that access to just green space has been linked with improved mental well being and cognitive development in children and lower psychological distress in teens. There's also been improvement in behaviors and symptoms of ADHD. There's been improvement in socio emotional competencies and a decrease in autism prevalence. So we think about this and we think, okay. But do we really know, we're, we're finding all of this out, but do we really know why? Why is this happening? You know, why are, the, why are we seeing these decreases in incidence of illness and that just by being outside? And really it's, it's all in the science. There's, there's many reasons, but one of them has to do with the actual chemical and biological agents that are given off by plants and trees. Many plants will give off phytoncides, or they're called antimicrobial antimicro volatile organic compounds. They're very active substances that help prevent the, the plants and the trees from rotting or from being eaten by insects and animals. So basically they're a defense mechanism, okay? But phytoncides, um, you know, they're produced by all plants, but they we see higher levels um, in trees like pines, firs, cedars, and oaks. And what happens is when you're out in the woods and the forest and in nature and you're breathing in those compounds, okay, um, it has the opposite effect on us uh, as far as defensive. It actually results in positive health implications like the reduction of blood pressure and boosted immune functioning. Also, um, if you take a forested area that has moving water, that has been found to contain a high concentration of negative air ions, which also reduce depression. There is also mycobacterium phacae, which is a microorganism in the soil, that is present as well and it appears to boost immune functioning. So um, there is a hormone, and I'm going to attempt to say this. It's very, very long. It's dehydroipium drostrone, um, but they call it DHEA. 
um, for short, with good reason. And it has been found to increase um, after a walk in the forest. And that is the hormone that get, helps produce testosterone and estrogen. So the DHEA hormone has cardioprotective, um, anti-obesity and anti-diabetic properties. There's also been increases shown in adiponectin, which produce, protects against atherosclerosis. And it also increases the immune system's anti-cancer cells, or what they call natural killer cells, that provide protection from cancer, viral infections, and other health issues. And it's amazing. These are all findings from just spending time in nature. So like if I could give you a pill that would do all of those things, we would probably, you know, those good things, we'd probably take it. But instead, you know, all we have to do is get out and be outside and enjoy what's around us. There are other reasons too, besides those very scientific ones um, there. We do know obviously that trees provide oxygen. Um, so that's always good for us, but they also help filter out pollutants as well. And they keep down the temperatures. You know, they basically keep the heat down. When you're in the woods, you walk into a, the, the forest, you can feel the temperature drop usually a little bit. Um, people also experience a lot more physical activity outside. Um, we do a lot of our sporting events outside. We walk, run, hike. Um, water sports, all of those things. And that also improves your physical and mental health. Obviously, we're getting exercise. And then our socialization, you know, being around others, um, that can increase when you're outdoors as well. And there's been a ton of research lately on um, the impact of, you know, socialization and making sure we're connected socially and, and not being isolated. So um, those are other reasons um, for the benefits as well. So there is still more to be done as far as researching. Um, they, you know, the studies continue to, to come in. In fact, I just like a week or so ago, I just got my hands on a new study that came out from the University of Illinois. And it was, uh, it's, it's authored by Andrea Faber-Taylor and she's in the Department of Crop Sciences. And she did a, a study on nature's effects on children with ADHD. And I mean, like I said, it just came out. And basically she was saying how a 20 minute walk in nature was almost as effective as a very popular medication that children take for ADHD. So um, there's, there's things coming in all the time, but we're looking at, um, there needs to be more on the nature's effects on youth. We also need to look at the, the idea of, do we have to be actually standing outside in trees or can we simulate that with like virtual reality and aromatherapy? You know, can we bottle that up if we need to? And, and can it be as effective? Uh, we're also looking at the things like the duration and frequency of the exposure. You know, what, what is optimal? Uh, what do you, what are the minimum amounts of, you know, what do you need to get the benefits that we're talking about? And we talk about is blue space, you know, we talk about green space, but what about blue space and water and, and is that as effective um, as the green spaces? And then of course, climate change is, is, is an ongoing thing. And how is, how will that affect us as we go forward? So again, there, there's just constant, I have two huge folders of just articles, um, this, of, you know, research going on. And, and um, just, again, the University of Illinois has a lot of its own going on with uh, Dr. Aaron Abada doing a lot of um, studies on nature and families and families actually going out together as a unit and benefiting out in nature and talking about attention restoration theory and, and that sort of thing. So again, there's just a lot of that. But now that I've talked about the research and what it does, I want to discuss a bit about um, the different ways you can immerse yourself in nature, okay? Because there's, there's a lot of different ways and there's different terms 
for it as well. Uh, one I want to share with you um, in particular is the Japanese practice of, it's called Shinrin Yoku. I hope I said that right. It translates to taking in the forest atmosphere, or they call it forest bathing. That means you're soaking up the sights, the smells, and the sounds of a natural setting to promote your physiological and psychological health. The objective in Shinrin Yoku is it wants to give participants an opportunity to slow down, appreciate things that can only be seen or heard um, when one is moving slowly, and to take a break from the stress of daily life. And it's interesting, um, the countries of Japan and South Korea, they've integrated this practice into their medical systems, um, and it can actually be something that's prescribed by a doctor and covered by insurance. So they're writing prescriptions for their citizens to go out into the forests and, and be with nature because they believe in, in the benefits that they're seeing. And there is a great book, um, if you wanna look further into that, it's called Forest Bathing, and it's by Dr. Ching Lee, and it was just published in 2018, and it gives details and history on this practice. Um, it also shares examples of techniques and shows like locations and photos of different forests around the world. And um, Dr. Lee is world renowned for his work in forest medicine. And he's actually been named the vice president and secretary general of the International Society of Nature and Forest Medicine. So um, yeah, he's done a lot of studies and, and the book is really good. And it's actually very um, reader friendly and uh, has beautiful pictures in it. So I recommend that one. But like I said, there's different terms for being out there. And forest bathing was probably one of the first ones used for nature immersion, but there are lots of other terms used. You might hear of people going on an awe walk, A-W-E, awe walk, um, or maybe they're nature bathing, forest or nature therapy. I, I particularly like to use mindful nature walk. I like to talk about that. And um, as a member of the family life team, uh, our educators, we talk about mindfulness and um, the practice of mindfulness. And basically that means being in the present moment, focusing on where you are and what you're doing right in that moment. So you're not worried about the past. You're not thinking about the future. You're only focusing um, and using all of your senses to experience the present moment. And there's a great amount of research on the act of practicing mindfulness and how beneficial that is for your mind and body. And there's many types of mindfulness techniques, or some people call them practices or invitations, but one of them is mindful walking. And mindful walking is basically paying attention to your actual walk and what your senses are taking in around you during the walk. If you combine that with taking that walk in that natural setting, you're getting the benefits of both mindfulness and being in nature. And so I have some um, tech, some you know tips and tricks on the screen, and these are techniques that were commonly used and suggested. Um, one and big one is you know find a good location with green space. And so does it have to be the woods or forest? No, it can be a park, a, your garden a nature preserve, you know, anywhere outside, obviously, but um, an area with conifers, they say, is preferred just to get those um, benefits I mentioned earlier with the fighting sides, you know, to get those. But um, just being outside in, in a green space is good. And it's usually suggested to leave your phone uh, off or in the car or just not on your person or on where it's going to distract you. Okay. That's not what the, the walk is about. Okay. You want to get away from that. Um, you want, even if you go as a group, because there's a lot of groups, though they will take these um, walks as groups, make sure there's time that you're using that's dedicated to being silent. Because in groups, we tend to want to chat and talk and, and everything. But we want to make sure we enjoy that silence 
and, and we can get the true benefit of why you're out there. You want to walk slower than you normally would and be aware of your footsteps. You know, being aware of uh, your, your each footstep on the ground, the surface under your feet, how that feels. It's because this is not a hike. Like, it's not for exercise, really. It's not, a, you know, a, a brisk walk or anything. This is, this is just, um, again, taking it all in as you're walking. So it, you will go slower. Um, engaging all your senses. So while you're walking, your, the touch, the feel, the, you know, sight, the sounds, everything. You're taking it all in with all your senses. Deep breathing, and you can do a variety of deep breathing exercises. There's lots of them out there, but making sure you get that oxygen in, in your lungs. And then there are some other variations. Um, maybe you find a spot to sit for a while and observe the nature from where you are. Some people like to take a journal and actually do some nature journaling. Um, some meditate. Some people do yoga. Um, there's something called a sound map. And that's where you would, um, you know, take kind of like you have a journal with you and you'd close your eyes and really focus on the sounds around you and map out where you're hearing those sounds on the paper. And so others like really get into studying the plants and the trees. And, and, and any of these are fine. All of the, these are all different techniques that are used. Um, and there's no right or wrong there. Um, again, it's just about being outside um, and being in that present moment and taking in all of, of what you see and, and all of the other senses that you engage. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brittany, and she is going to talk more about sensory gardens and other sensory activities. All right. Thanks so much, Sherry. Mm -hmm. All right, so not everyone has access, you know, to a, a large maybe forest preserve or a large natural space, um, but a sensory garden or using plants to engage our senses is really something that, that anybody can do to experience nature. Um, so think about the last time you sat in your garden, you're breathing in those fresh herbal scents, you're listening to the natural sounds like the bees buzzing or the birds chirping, and you really enjoyed the, the fresh flowers, the arrangements, the colorful blooms, and the foliage that you planted in the spring. The garden is, is really a, a wonderful, perfect place to stimulate our senses, which in turn is going to promote our physical health and our well-being. So a sensory garden is, is really a, a thoughtfully designed space, which includes um, and arranges specific plants to engage and stimulate one or more of our five senses, so the sight, the smell, the sound, the taste, and the touch. They're also designed to attract um, and encourage those visitor, visitors to view the plants up close. They don't just want you to stroll through the garden enjoying the, the beautiful scenery, but they want you to get up close and interact and touch those plants, smell those plants, engage with them. And a lot of these sensory gardens are, are typically designed for young children, but they can be for any age any ability, they could be for any any site, any person that could benefit from engaging with, with plants. And they can really be any size, no matter if you have a, a little balcony garden with just a few containers or just a, a square, a couple few square feet um, in your yard that you have left to plant, or you're, you're planting a, a thousand foot sensory garden at a, at a public garden, you can create a sensory garden. You can also create little rooms within the garden to stimulate one um, sense at a time or multiple senses all together. It really is up to you and what you what your goal of the, the garden is going to be. All right, and sensory gardens are really multifunctional. They not only allow you to connect with nature, but they encourage you to be more aware of your surrounding and your response to them. And this really taps into that practice of mindfulness that Sherry was talking about. So spending time in a, a sensory garden can help you enhance your senses um, of well-being. It can help reduce the stress. It can calm your mind. But how can it be used? Um, it's really unlimited. So, for example, a teaching garden at schools, at preschools, nature centers, homes, you know, getting those 
kids, those any ages, to go out there and learn about shape, learn about colors, learn about the life cycle. So getting them to really observe the plants is, is such a great lesson. Um, they can also be therapeutic for individuals with developmental or physical disabilities, maybe sensory processing disorders, or even some cognitive challenges. They're also very relaxing. As the, we, we need that calming space for, for us, for anyone to enjoy and to appreciate. Um, but when we design a sensory garden, we want to keep in mind who our audience is. We want to make it safe. We want to make it practical for that audience. So we do want to make it design specific for who our audience is going to be. So if you're designing for children, maybe it's going to be a, a smaller space. It's going to be not so overwhelming for a little body to go in there and, and go in and explore. Um, if you're designing for a visually impaired audience, maybe you make narrow beds to keep the plants within reach so they don't have to trip over any plants or, or step on any plants to really experience those um, activities. If you're designing for tactile uh, kinesthetic learners, so those, those people who learn best by touching and doing versus learning, keep that in mind of, of um, your plants are going to be touched, your plants are, are going to be interactive. Um, and then sensory gardens are also great for therapeutic horticulture. So this is where participants are going to enhance their well-being, maybe actively or passively with their involvement in plant or plant-related activities. So this would be a, a great resource for um, therapeutic horticulture programs at um, hospitals, senior centers, um, rehab, schools, anywhere that, that these individuals could benefit. Um, and also keep in mind that maybe raised beds, like here in this picture, or wider pathways is going to allow accessible um, the garden to be accessible to all, no matter what um, method they are walking through the garden. All right, so we're going to talk about the, the five senses and how we can incorporate plants for each of those. So for our site, we want to remember to use contrasting color and texture and form so that it can stimulate our sense of sight. Our warm colors like the red, the orange, the yellows are energizing, while the cool colors like the blues, the purples, and the whites are more relaxing. So the plants you select should probably be both stimulating and calming. So keeping that in mind, maybe different areas for, for the purpose. You also want to include different colors of blooms and foliage. Um, the color or the interest doesn't always have to come from the flower, though. A lot of plants have really colorful, really interesting foliage. I think of Persian shield and the iridescent purple leaves and how stunning they are and just how it could pop in a, a garden like that. So think outside the box. You know, it always have to have beautiful blooming flowers, but interesting textures. You also want to utilize plants that have unique habits. So your creeping plants, maybe some climbing or some trailing, some upright habits. So all these different growth habits are going to add texture and interest in the garden so your eye is moving around it and not just all on one plane. Um, you also want to incorporate some plants that bloom at different times of the day or different season. So summer bloomers are, are pretty easy for us to find as gardeners. But make sure to have some spring bloomers like our, our spring bulbs or some fall blooms like asters and mums. Um, and this is also good for the pollinators because our pollinators come out early and they, they stay late. So it'll be good for our senses and then our pollinators. Um, but I think of the gazanias that close up on a cloudy day or at night. And they're, they're really doing this to protect the, the part of the reproductive system. But it's really interesting flowers. Um, that may not be open all the time in the garden. And then also remember um, different like leaf patterns or shapes, unusual bark, some stem colors like the red twig dogwoods are going to provide really interesting texture, color all, all season long. Um, so in our winter season when we don't have foliage, these, these trees, these shrubs are going to provide some, some interest as well. So some plants that you can incorporate for site. So you know that I could do, I could cover a hundred different plants for site, and this is only going to be a few. So these are some just some ideas. Um, the sunflowers are are always my favorite. This giant bright yellow sunflower towering above the garden just makes everybody smile. Um, nowadays there are a lot of cultivars with 
with different heights or sizes, different bloom colors. But no matter what, they're always so striking, so cheery in a garden. I just love how they bring that element to any garden, but especially for a, for um, energizing our sight. So they're very, very perfect flowers for that. Um, also take advantage of the fall color of trees and shrubs. So here's a, a river birch with this gorgeous yellow foliage. Um, there are a lot of trees that have just stunning fall reds and oranges and browns that can add to your fall seasonal sensory garden um, as well. And then the the birches also have really interesting bark. So our our sensory garden doesn't always have to be flowers. It could be interesting bark or trees or shrubs. Some have some bark is really interesting how it peels or shreds. Other bark um, maybe has a certain color. The beech trees are that smooth gray, like elephant look bark. And then some of our trees are gonna change as they mature as well. So when they're smaller, they may not have as that interesting bark, but as they get older, this really stunning feature pops out. Um, and then our snapdragons, our annual bedding plants that we find at the garden center in the spring are, are always a welcome of color in, in any garden, um, but especially our, our sensory gardens where we want bright, colorful flowers. These snapdragons are, are just fun little flowers, the upright habit. Our bottom left is our Japanese maple. These are great specimen trees for any landscape or any garden. That dark red foliage with the, the feathery leaves, the fringe leaves, um, and creates a really nice visual. And then in the wind, it's nice blowing, creates movement in the wind. Um, so we don't want to forget about our, our smaller trees or our shrubs when we're designing a sensory garden because they can add a lot of structure to our, our landscape. Um, and then I can't go without saying zinnias. Zinnias are one of my favorites because they're so easy to grow. They are just so bright and cheery and full of color and they attract so many butterflies, which again will bring in a different aspect of sight to a sensory garden. When we have pollinators visiting the colorful wings, the sounds, so can't, I would not have a garden without having a mix of zinnias in it as well. So smell. So our, our freshly cut grass uh, in, the, in the springtime, those, those earthy aromas of the dirt, the beautiful floral fragrances, you know, these are some of the great garden senses that um, stimulate our senses. Um, smell is often the, the strongest human sense. And with it has the potential to bring back a lot of specific memories or experiences to individuals. So sometimes when I'm walking through a store, I get a whiff of this really specific floral perfume that my grandma used to wear, and it, it just reminds me of her. So it, I totally understand where it, it takes you back. It, it has a, it brings you back to those memories. Um, maybe for you, it's a sweet smelling gardenia that reminds you of a, a European vacation, or maybe the fresh lilac, such a recognizable scent, but maybe it takes you back to growing up, you had one at your house, and you always remember smelling that. So flowers, um, fragrances just trigger a lot of memories for us. Some plants release scents naturally um, without needing to be touched. So this like rose is a classic example. It smells heavenly without having to crush it or rub it. Other plants or leaves are gonna have, are gonna be need um, rubbed or crushed to release that scent. Monarda is one of these. You can get a, a faint smell from Monarda, but if you crush it and smell it, it's so strong. So keep it that in mind of plants may not always have a scent as you walk by, but you crush it, you rub it between your fingers and it's gonna have a, a very strong scent. And then herbs are perfect additions to any sensory gardens because they, they smell delicious. They can be uh, freshly picked and can be taste tested. Um, if you aren't encouraging gardening visitors to actually taste though, that's okay because plants can still make uh, that nice connection to maybe favorite recipes. So the, the um, basil smell maybe reminds you of the pesto. So it's, it's okay to, um, to not have them taste the plants. But herbs are, are wonderfully scented plants to include in the sensory gardens. All right, so our wonderfully smelling plants 
um, some examples. Lavender, this is just so delightful, so relaxing scent in the garden. And this plant has both scented flowers and leaves, which makes it kind of unique. And those flower heads can be harvested and used in sachets inside. Just a very relaxing scent. Marigold, so this is this is a tough one for me. You, you either love the smell of marigold or you hate it. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan of marigold smell, but it's a very strong, musky, distinct smell that is very different from other things. And it, it can repel deer or rabbits, but it's also going to attract a lot of pollinators to your garden. Uh, scented geraniums on the, on the far right come in a lot of different scents. You can have rose or citrus or mint, a lot of different uniquely scented leaves for those scented geraniums. One that's pretty unique is the citronella scented geranium. Um, it does not, unfor unfortunately, repel insects like is sometimes marketed, but it is a really pleasant citrusy scent that is just a unique smell in a plant. Um, and then our, our bottom left, basil. This is one of my favorite botanical smells. It's so fresh and earthy, um, a great addition to a sensory garden, and they can also be used to, to make pesto as well for that taste. Um, our next picture is viburnum. So we can't forget about our flowering trees and shrubs in the century garden as well. This picture is the Korean spice viburnum. It has a really sweet smell in the springtime. We have a lot of shrubs, like the next picture, the lilac, that have just very strong scents in the garden in the, in the springtime that just add a, a nice dimension um, a nice addition to our garden as well. All right, touch. So to create a, a sensory experience um, for touch, there we go. And we want to include a lot of different types of surfaces or textures in our garden. We want to incorporate elements that are hard or soft or smooth, rough, fuzzy, or maybe even sticky. And with this, we can include plants that, um, with different plant parts that have these textures. So maybe the bark is really rough, or the flower head is really spiky, or the fruit is bumpy, the leaves are really fuzzy. So think about the different parts of the plant and the different textures they offer as well. It doesn't always have to be the foliage or the stem that can cr contributes to the touch aspect of a sensory garden. And we also want to make sure we pick pretty tough plants. So our, our purpose of our garden is to get everyone to touch, to feel those plants. So they're going to have a little bit of handling more than usual. So they should um, be tougher plants that can handle that handling, not be so gentle that they break, they, they fall apart easily. So keep that in mind when you're, you're picking those, those plants. Touch. Plants for touch. So the top left are lamb's ear. That's like our classic sensory touch plant. The leaves are covered in these tiny fibers that make the surface fuzzy, like an actual lamb's ear. And the soft hair on the leaves and the stem help prevent the plant from losing moisture, but it makes it really um, exceptionally drought tolerant. So very um, just un unreal type of plant feel. It feels like a lamb's ear. Very very nice to have in a sensory garden. Straw flowers, that center picture with the bright yellow flower. These have really have stiff, like paper-like flowers that feel and even sound like crumpled tissue paper when you squeeze it. it. It almost makes you think like, is this even alive? Is this, is this dried out already? They have really long bloom seasons, but they can also be harvested for as everlasting to bring in your home as well. Our next picture is sedums or really any type of succulent. These have leaves and stems and roots um, that have become really fleshy and are, are used to store water to be drought tolerant. So if you squeeze them between your hand, they're going to feel squishy. They're going to give a little bit. So those are always a nice texture to um, compare to, to thinner leaves. The bottom left picture is the Rattlesnake Master. And this is a, a native perennial to Illinois. They have really rigid, spiny stems and like thistle-like flower head. So think about how that would feel on your hands when you would touch it, like very pokey. 
and this makes a really interesting color and texture in the garden as well with the, the grayish blue color. The center is Celosia. So Celosia come in uh, three different types. The plumed version, as this picture shows, is, is very feathery feeling, feathery looking. There's also the wheat Celosia that's a single stalk. It feels more like papery. And there's also the coxcomb type that looks like coral or sometimes like people say it looks like a brain and this is really squishy really really large heads that um, are, are very colorful very bright and cheery in the garden but they have really interesting textures if you if you gently feel them and on the bottom right picture is artemisia worm wood um, this has exceptionally fine foliage that feels very sil silky when you put your hands through it. It's like a cool, very soft feel. And this grayish foliage adds uh, a unique color to the garden. It's not green like a lot of our plants. And it's, it's very low growing, so it makes a nice brown cover. So when you're down low to the ground, you can sit there, run your hands through this very soft, fine foliage um, to, to help relax. Sound. So some sounds in our garden are going to occur naturally. When we have wind blowing through the plants, there may be leaves crunching um, beneath our feet. But to stimulate the sense of sound, we want to select flora that makes noises when the wind blows through them, like grasses or, or the leaves on the plants. Um, but we also want to include elements in our garden that can create contrasting sounds. We don't want all of it to sound the same, all the grass blowing. We want a lot of different sounds. We want interest, we want variation. We don't want it to just be one constant sound. So dried plant material like seed pods or a dried clumping bamboo can, can make some like deep or rattle shakes. Um, wind chimes or water fountains can also cal um, add calming sound as well. Bird feeders and bird baths can attract our friends. So a lot of different ways that we can add um, sound to our to our garden. So the top left picture, that's our um, some ornamental grasses like switchgrass or miscanthus. They form these really dense bunches and then rustle in the wind. So those of you who grow ornamental grasses at home, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That that rustling um, when on a windy day, how that grass just flows back and forth. Um, the top middle picture is Virginia or pig squeak, and this common name comes from the reference that the, of the noise it makes when you rub the leaf between your finger and your thumb. So it makes a little squeak sound, so the common name is pig squeak. It's a very slick, kind of a thicker leaf, makes a little, a little squeak, something unique that you have to do to interact with the plant as well. On the top right picture, love and a mist seed pods. So these are gorgeous blue flowers. But the the seed pod, the dried seed pod, turns you know papery on the outside, and then you shake it, and the seeds are on the inside. So this is a way to use those dried plant products as as sound. Bottom left are purple cone flowers. So this one's not making sound itself, but it is going to attract the birds which are going to be a very pleasant sound to have those chirping birds in our garden eating the dried seed pods. So a different way of adding sound to our garden. And the middle picture, fallen leaves. So it's the time of year for our leaves to start turning and falling, creating that mat down on the ground. So these leaves can be pretty windy on, or pretty loud on a windy day. But they also crunch bet beneath our feet as we walk over them. So if you've ever gone for a, a walk in the woods on a quiet fall day, and you're trying really careful to be like quiet and stealthy, and like every step you take, it's like crunch, crunch, crunch. So these just add a really unique texture to a garden um, that we we can't get all season, but the fall is a special time to add that that crunch to the garden. Um, and then the bottom right picture are the Baptisia, that false blue indigo dried seed pod. So they, they have beautiful blue flowers, but then if you leave the 
flower head on and they dry, it creates these pods with rather large seeds inside and you shake it and it kind of sounds like a maraca when you're shaking, shaking the seed pod. So just a unique way you could cut these or leave them on as a way to, to add interest to the garden. Taste. So a variety of fruits and vegetables and even herbs can be added to a sensory garden to explore the taste in the garden. Edible flowers are really interesting um, way to, to eat plants. So nasturtiums and pansies are actually really tasty when you add them to a, a salad. They um, add some color and, and flavor to our gardens and people don't always think to that we can eat flowers, right? We think we eat fruits and vegetables. And then herbs are always a great way to bring in both that smell and the taste that we had talked about basil and chives and lemon balm all have those really distinct flavors and you don't need a whole lot when you're going to taste it just ripping off a tiny leaf or a part of a leaf to get that that sensory experience um, can can be enough and then growing fruit that can easily be picked fresh off the plant and engage with our with our senses when we pick them or eat them um, it is just we have several different types of fruit at our house, and harvesting the ripe fruit is one of my kids' favorite things to do. They search through the bushes, find that perfectly ripe raspberry, and they really eat them like as fast as they can pick them. But if I brought them inside the house, I guarantee you they wouldn't eat them. It's really that joy of eating them right off the plant, that sensory experience of this fresh smell, the cool juices on their fingers. And that delicious flavor right there on their tongue as they're out in nature um, is, is really such an experience for them. Um, we can also include plants that we would use in different recipes um, for in a sensory garden, so a, like a salsa garden or a pizza garden. Um, all the scents and the flavors together can remind us of some of those recipes that we eat often. So a couple things to, to keep in mind, if you are gonna encourage garden visitors to taste from the garden, we wanna clearly identify which plants are edible. We don't wanna combine edible plants with non-edible plants and the chance of, of mixing it up. And it's okay if you don't encourage tasting in your sensory garden, it really has to deal with your place and your audience. You can instead encourage visitors um, to use their, their other senses to identify plants that they eat or maybe go in one of the recipes and ask them to imagine eating those plants of what it would taste like. So instead of actually tasting, let's let's imagine, let's pretend right now. So it's totally gonna depend on your audience if, if you encourage that, that tasting right there in your sensory garden. So some great plants for, for Engaging our taste sense, nasturtiums here on the top left, um, one of the edible flowers I talked about, have a very distinct round leaf for the foliage, but then the, the flowers are so bright. You know, they're usually like orange, red, or yellow, and they have this little peppery taste to them, kind of like watercress. And the more sun they get, the hotter the weather is, the spicier these little flowers are going to get. They're just a, a nice little colorful flower that we could sample in the garden. Uh, center is apple trees. Apple trees can add height to a garden, maybe to climb if, if that's allowed at that space. Um, but they also offer this fresh, tasty treat in the fall that um, can be harvested and, and then consumed to enjoy. Um, you also get to experience and appreciate the entire life cycle by watching it bloom in the spring, the you know, those pollinators visiting it, and then watching the apple develop throughout the summer and then waiting until fall when it's ready to harvest. So it, it, gets, it shows you that, that whole cycle of the, from flower to, to fruit. And the chives, you have the, the hollow round stems can be harvested fresh with that mild onion flavor. Some people don't like onions, so beware. Um, but the flowers can also be harvested and ate. Um, maybe in a, a garnish as a garnish or something. Strawberries on the bottom left are another fruit that can be grown 
easily in a sensory garden. So our ever-bearing and our day-neutral strawberries are great for the gardeners with limited spaces. Um, they're going to produce the the straw the ever-bearing are going to produce strawberries um, in the spring, summer, and fall. Those three specific times. The day-neutral will produce fruit throughout their growing season. And they're not going to produce runners, so they're not going to take over your garden. But they would be great for maybe a terraced or raised bed in your sensory garden. Well, there's also like pyramids that you can plant fresh strawberries. Um, they can also be used as like an edging plant or ground cover, but just the bright red color and then the joy of finding a, a berry and the fresh, uh, just eating it fresh from the garden, there's nothing like it. And then mint, um, here in the middle, um, there are a lot of different mints that can be grown. Most popular are probably peppermint or spearmint. But beware, they can aggressively spread by these underground rhizomes. So if you are going to have mint in your garden, I would suggest planting it in a container to contain those rhizomes. Or if you do want to put it in the ground, maybe bury it in a bottomless container and then plant it in that so that the roots can't spread. And just keep an eye on it so it doesn't take over your garden. But it is a nice plant um, to connect with other mints that we eat, like candy canes or peppermints. Um, so having the, the actual leaf, the mint leaf there to, to enjoy in our sensory garden would be nice. And then cherry tomatoes. Um, I just love picking cherry tomatoes off the vine. Um, most of our cherry tomatoes are going to be indeterminate, so they're going to continue to grow and flower and set fruit all summer until the, the fall when the frost kills it. They're going to have these really sprawling growth habits that require a little bit of support, but they are going to be prolific producers that really can be picked right off the vine and really tasted right there in the garden. So many varieties now just, just taste like candy. They're so delicious. So an experience that smell, the tomatoes have a very distinct smell, and then getting to enjoy that tomato that's been under the warm sun all day. It's just very unique experience, one that's very rewarding and delicious. All right, non-plant elements. So a sensory garden doesn't have to just contain plants that appeal to the senses, but maybe some hardscapes, some pathways, some things for the wildlife. So for our, our hardscapes, we want to provide different textures that can be seen or felt. So our, our pathways could be sand or wood chips or some kind of stone or concrete. Um, water features provide another wonderful sensory experience for that sound, the sight, and the touch. And this could include like fountains or ponds, any kind of moving water. Interpretive signs are also great to have in, in a in its place in a, in a sensory garden. So these are going to make visitors aware, um, excited about something maybe they hadn't noticed, or that's gonna, they're going to be interactive, ask them to do something, share something with them. And then wildlife, um, the, the buzzing of the bees, the, cr the chirping of the crickets, the hummingbirds, um, those are all going to stimulate our sense of, of hearing. So we want to keep them happy, and we want to keep inviting them to our garden, so including those bird feeders. Maybe some toad houses, some bird baths, things to attract the wildlife as well. All right, when it comes to choosing plants for your sensory garden, just like any garden, you want to select plants with various colors, heights, and textures, and bloom, just to keep it interesting, make it beautiful. You also want to keep in mind the hardiness of the plants. So if you're okay with planting annuals every year, that's fine, that's great. But if you want perennials you want, that come back every year, you want to make sure it's going to be hardy to your area so it survives those winters. Um, you also want to in, ensure safety in the garden. So plants should be non-toxic. You don't want to use poisonous or allergic plants in a garden that encourages tasting or touching. And the Poison Control Center has a list of, of poisonous plants online. Um, also remember that some plants can cause skin irritations. So that would be another thing to consider is that you don't have plants that, that could cause rashes or um, irritations on the skin. You also want to make sure your, your plants are going to be relatively pest and disease free. You don't want to be applying pesticides in this type of garden. 
so plants that are easy to grow. Embrace exploration in the garden. Once you install the garden, you want to make sure to remember that exploration is your goal. Sensory gardens may get a little bit more picking or prodding or touching than some of those other type of gardens, um, but it's really all in this experience of a sensory garden. So although um, you you can certainly set some limits, some parameters to make sure your, your visitor, visitors know what they can do and not do, but make sure they they feel free to interact with the plants and the special features in your garden, because that's a really important part of this learning and this mindfulness process is, is interacting and with this garden and touching and feeling and, and being up close with it. So embrace exploring in it. All right, now on to uh, sensory activities in the, um, sensory activities in nature. So our world has so many beautiful places to offer. Um, we don't want sensory exploration or engagement to end in the garden. So whether you're visiting a local park or a nature preserve or a state or national park, um, we want you to be able to, to um, engage those senses. So every single one of them, every single site has something special to offer our senses. So some simple ideas that we can use to connect our senses in nature. Um, here's an example of a, a very popular simple sensory connection technique. Um, it doesn't require any paper, no guide, really just your eyes, your ears, your nose, and your hands. Um, and you're going to be able to tune into your surroundings and connect with nature and, and really notice all of your senses. So you can try this real quick um, right where you're sitting. So take a deep breath and focus on five things you can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. So next time you're outside, give this a try and, and see how it works for you. Maybe it's something you could do every time you walk outside as, as your way to welcome yourself to the outdoors. Um, this multi-sensory practice can help calm us, can focus our mind, um, either if it's in a sensory garden or natural place, can be that, that soothing es escape for us. Our next one is a sit spot. So Sherry briefly talked about finding your spot to sit. So how many of you growing up sat under a special tree or you hid under a shrub as your magical forge? So you want to, a sit spot is a term used to describe a place where one's just going to go sit still and observe. Your sit spot is really your special place. It can be under a, a giant oak tree or a comfy bench at the park, or maybe it's near a lake or stream, uh, but it must have a view of something wild. And when you're in your sit, sit spot, you're going to quietly observe the world around you for at least 10 minutes. And you, what do you notice? What do you hear? What do you smell? So don't forget to use all your senses, and you're going to really immerse yourself in that moment. And then after those 10 minutes, you can journal your observations um, or you can just reflect. But by sitting and being in the moment in your sit spot, you get that much needed to break from our hectic schedules. I know I could certainly use this at times. Um, so research shows that even the short break in nature can improve our, our health and increase our product productivity by refreshing our focus. So I challenge you all to find a sit spot somewhere special for you to go and, and reflect and, and engage your senses. A sensory scavenger hunt. So this can be for any age. Do not say, think this is just for kids, but this is a great hands-on sensory motor activity that encourages to explore with our senses in the world around us. We want to do want to be cautious when allowing exploration exploration with taste for this activity though. It's going to determine be determined by our sight. So this can be done in your backyard or a forest, a park, wherever. Um, you can find a, a scavenger hunt already created on the internet, print it out, take it along, or you can come up with something totally on your own depending on your location. So in these two pictures, my family and I were on a hike at Star Rock Park, and after a while my kids were, were getting a little bored, and they like kept saying, Mom, I want to go back to the hotel. Let's go, let's go. I'm ready. So I challenged them to this impromptu scavenger hunt. So we could all just slow down, look for the clues in nature. And we looked for different colors and foliage shapes. 
We listened for the running water, the birds chirping. We felt different textures as the, the sand, um, the rocks or the sandy soil. We smelled fragrant flowers and what the different soils smelled like. So this off the cuff sensory scavenger hunt was really a, a highlight of our hike, highlight of our trip up there. And we were able to engage our senses and appreciate this really unique site, this unique experience um, in Illinois, um, instead of just rushing back to the hotel so we could get into the swimming pool. So it was a very unique way just to slow down and, and appreciate and get the little ones to, to really look at nature and look where we were. Uh, yoga in nature is also um, a, an easy way to connect with nature um, by practicing out in a natural space. So when you perform yoga outside, you can smell the fresh air. Uh, you can listen to the animals, the birds. You can gaze up at the sky. Um, you can also look at the beautiful trees, the shrubs, the plants around you. Um, when when you practice yoga, it engages the, the body and the mind and the senses by bringing a, a deeper awareness and a connection to, to all that the nature provides. And the practice of yoga can awaken the five senses really no matter where you are. So by being out in nature, you can, you can do this with our, our natural environment. And this, this doesn't have to be anything complicated or complex. Um, it can be as simple as standing tall and breathing deeply. And there are a lot of different levels of yoga for beginners to advance, to do what you're capable of, capable and comfortable of doing, but it's a, a very nice practice to, to do in nature and be aware and to awaken those senses. Other ideas for um, Spending time in nature, you know, there are really endless, endless ideas to improve our health and wellness outside. Um, I'm just going to go through a quick, some quick ideas of um, ways we can, you can start. So nature journaling, and that's going to prompt that relaxation, that calmness. It's going to enhance that experience by offering an, an outlet, out, uh, offering an outlet for the self-expression of journaling or art. And it can be as simple as writing down or drawing what you're hearing or seeing or feeling. Um, you can also buy nature journals that include prompts that help you focus on something specific for that day, like describe your favorite season and why. Cloud watching or stargazing. Um, I remember as a kid laying in my yard on summer day with my brothers, watching the clouds just float above and finding the images that resembled something in real life. And it was just a really nice pause from other activities to calm down, calmly watch the formations in the sky and use our imagination. Um, stargazing is very similar to this, but we often forget about it because it has to be dark to do it, and usually we're inside. Um, but you don't need to know what you're looking at when you're stargazing. You don't have to know if it's a star or a planet or what the constellation is. Just gaze up at the universe and, and really let your mind wander. Uh, tree and plant observations. Um, whether you're walking through your yard or a park or, or maybe the woods, we tend to look down instead of, or even straight ahead to make sure we don't trip over anything, right? But we're missing so much around us. Next time you're taking a stroll, stop at a certain plant to really look at it, observe those botanical features, characteristics, and be purposeful when you're looking at the spring flowers on the trees or the leaf shape of your perennials. And this will really help you to develop and appreciate the world, the plants around you. Birding, so this is a hobby that anybody, any age can enjoy, and it really heightens our sense of hearing because we have to listen carefully for those flying creatures around us. So do you hear a, a bird call or a song? You know, what's it trying to tell you? You can identify birds through this way, but this is a great way to use our sense of hearing. A plit playing or digging in the soil or sand. Get your hands dirty. Digging in the dirt really does lift our spirits. I can attest, I, this, it totally does. Digging stirs up the microbes in the soil. So in, and then inhaling those microbes can stimulate the serotonin production, which makes us feel happier, relaxed. So it does, there's proven science that shows it, it helps us to be happier. Um, same goes for sand. We don't have much sand here in Illinois, so think about how digging your toes into those, that warm sand on the beach feels. It's, it's just very relaxing, very calming. Uh, nature photography is another um, 
great way. You don't need any fancy equipment or training to do this. The phone in your pocket book was just or in, your, in your pocket will it work just fine. Um, but you want to find shapes or patterns or interesting insects and, and capture them with your camera. And this is really going to make you be present and really focus on on what is around you. And that sound map, Sherry talked about that sound map briefly, um, but it's really journaling what you hear around you is and being again focusing on on hearing instead of what we're always looking at and those loose part kits and this is really for indoors sometimes we're not always able to get outdoors um, so it's okay to bring it inside these loose kits are um, used to create this unstructured environment with this natural material so our rocks our pine cones our seeds our twigs our leaves and, and use that to connect with and play and create with these loose parts. All right, finishing up here. So a group of Illinois Extension educators um, are currently working on a group of materials that really can be utilized by any community member, any educational organization to promote wellness in nature. So if it's um, sensory walk prompts or activity guides or sensory garden signs, these will be free resources available for anyone to use at any site. So watch for an email this fall coming from Illinois Extension regarding these resources. You can also reach out to me or Sherry if you have any questions. But we're really excited to expand the idea of promoting wellness in nature in our communities and in our state um, because it, it, it is so important for all of us right now to, to keep focusing on our health and our well-being. And, we can do that right outside our door. So keep watching for that. Um, and Sherry, if you want to talk about this one real quick. Oh yeah, it's it's just a part of the package that she's been talking about that um, these will be yard signs. And we actually piloted this a while um, during the Farm Progress Show, but we will have those invitations, so to speak, where you can like get them printed off um, on your own. And as you see, this one is about um, the sense of touch, but uh, it will it will be about all the different senses. It'll be about the breathing techniques. It'll be and it'll kind of guide you. And you could put these yard signs up in on trails and things, and um, let people self guide and follow them, and um, and you know be able to participate in a in a mindful nature walk. All right. And last thing, I, I do want to leave you with a, a quote. So, just being surrounded by bountiful nature rejuvenates and inspires us. And that was from E.O. Wilson, The Theory of Biophilia, which is a whole other wonderful topic. Um, but I do, I want to encourage you all to go outside this afternoon. It is gorgeous outside. And try some of these techniques, these practices um, that we've mentioned today. And um, I, I hope you all find value or, or learn something, something you can take away to help increase your, your well-being, improve your well-being out in nature with some of these activities. So thank you so much. And um, if you want to attend past recordings of the Four Seasons webinar, they are all posted on YouTube. A wonderful selection of, of um, horticulture gardening topics on there that I encourage every one of you to go look at. Very, very great topic. Um, and then we, we do ask you to take a brief survey. You can, uh, to provide feedback on this presentation, you can scan this code with your mobile phone, the QR code, or you can go to the, the short link, go.illinois.edu slash wellness2023. 